everyone, welcome back to the channel. Thanks for tuning in for another episode. We made it back from Redcrest, not necessarily the result that I was looking for. We ended up finishing 26th place. We just missed the top 20 cut to qualify to fish day three by a couple of pounds. Overall, it's a tournament where I have very mixed feelings. Like I feel really good about what I was doing. I did not execute. That's the problem. You know, so sometimes you sometimes you come away from a bad tournament and you feel like you had a good tournament because you got the bites, you were doing what you were supposed to do. And in this case, that's how I felt. The reality is though you come away from a bad tournament and you had a bad tournament. So in this case, I feel like I was doing what I should have done, but my apparently my execution was not good, meaning I lost four scoreable bass the first day. Uh, I had a four and a half pounder right up to the side of the boat, a couple of two and a half pounders pulled off on the way to the boat, and then I had one that I broke off in a tree. It got me down in a tree. It was definitely a good quality fish. Never saw it, but I have no doubt it was a good one. On day three, I pretty much had the same thing happen. Two fish pulled off and I broke one off again in a tree. You know, they, I, what I was fishing was a lot of fast current. So generally speaking, those fish would hit and they either would come right at the boat towards deeper water or they would bite and go right into the cover that you were at. And they would use the current to their advantage. So they were, you know, twice as fast because we had extremely fast current. The current now was dropping overall, but it was still a very fast current even during the tournament days. So let me give you a little bit of a background. We got there in practice. You know, I don't know much about Lay Lake, never been there before, but I know that it's a good spot of bass fishery. I know the river can be a major player. I like to consider myself a river guy. And from that standpoint, I checked the river out the first day of practice. Uh, and I had some good quality bites that day. I think I had like six keeper bites, but most of them were in that two and a half to three and a half pound range. So I liked what I saw. The problem was the couple of days before the first day of practice, we had tons and tons of rain and the river was flooding. Now, when I say flooding, it was still within its banks, but the way that Coosa River sets up on Lay Lake is it's very steep banks. Uh, so even though the river was up probably five feet, it was still kind of contained in the banks, meaning, yes, there were trees in the water, but you still could fish current seams. You still could fish a lot of the cover that was where those fish were going to be. Because the reality is there's not much cover in the middle of that river for those fish to go to. So they relate to the banks. The problem is when you do add five feet of water, it becomes much harder to fish everything because there's just that many more targets and the, the current was that much faster, making it harder to put your bait where the fish needed to be. But I really liked what I saw that first day of practice. Uh, day two of practice, I spent down on the lake. Now, what I have since found is I did not go far enough south. At the bottom couple miles of the lake were the major players. I spent a lot of that time more mid-lake, and I was looking to do the offshore thing with... Uh, with, you know, forward facing sonar, looking for spotted bass that are suspended out in the middle of the lake, basically. And what I found was I got a lot of bites. I, I came in contact with a lot of fish, but it seemed like I had to catch a lot of fish to catch a two pound keeper. <clears throat> so I didn't really like that. <coughs> Excuse me. I didn't like the fact that I didn't know when that next keeper bite was going to come. And I did have a couple of pretty good lulls, meaning I'd go into an area and there were a decent number of fish and, you know, you get some bites, maybe three or four shorts, and then you'd catch a two pounder. I never saw a big fish doing that either. My biggest fish were like two and a quarter pounds. <clears throat> uh, and I will say the other thing is the fish were relating to bait fish, but the thing is there was bait fish everywhere. Like it wasn't just because you found bait fish, you found fish. You go pretty much in any pocket and there was tons and tons of bait. So it was not super easy to break down. And I just did not like what I saw. <clears throat> so the third day of practice, I decided I would go explore the river again for the first half of the day, just to see what it looked like. Cause I knew that the, the river was coming down, the current had dropped a little bit and I wanted to see how the, the river was setting up. So I went up there and I mean, it definitely had fallen about four feet. The current had dropped a little bit, still fast for sure, but had dropped <clears throat> a lot more fishable targets in the water. And what I ended up finding was that I could get bit on current seams way up the river. And then when I got to the lower river, 
I could I could get some nice bites on Currented docks, you know, shaded docks in the afternoon that still had really fast current. You'd throw a bait up under there, and the current would wash the bait right out. So they were fast moving docks, but the fish were relating to them. <clears throat> and on that day, I ended up having 10 keeper bites. I wasn't fishing hard, and I felt pretty good because, again, when I got bit in the river, I would say 80% of them were keeper bites, at least during practice for sure. Generally in that two and a quarter to three and a half pound range, I did in practice have one really big one, you know, a four plus. And in the tournament, I ended up losing a four, probably a four and a half pounder. So my plan going into the tournament was to start way up the river on day one, because we get a half hour to launch to the time lines go in. So I wanted to get way up the river and then work my way back. So I was going to within almost eyesight of the dam, to be honest with you. <clears throat> so from that same point, I, uh, I ran up there, ended up pretty much fishing a minute after lines in. So, you know, you know, I went a long ways, but I was able to maximize my fishing time because I wasn't running up there during fishing time. In that first period, I ended up catching four nice scoreable fish. I was sitting in 10th place and it was going all right. And I really felt good because you know, the, the river still was dropping, everything was fishable, everything still was setting up the same way. The current seams had moved out a little bit, but they were still setting up in a decent manner. I worked my way down river, and that midsection really completely uh, fooled me. I didn't have any real bites in the midsection of the river. And from that standpoint, the issue with that was, um, you know, I just ended up really running into a lot of water that in practice, I found fish that were positioning based on current. Well, that lowers the midsection really started having more fish kind of spreading out. The current was weakening at that point, and the current seams were not setting up nearly as good. Now, at the end of the second period, I did get down to where those docks were, and I ended the period by pulled up on a, on a dock that had a really nice current seam under it. Ended up losing a two and a half. Next cast lost a four and a half. Next cast caught a 115. Uh, a couple casts later, finally caught a 2-1, caught a bunch more shorts, and then caught one that I think was like two and a quarter. So I ended that period really good, or, uh, you know, I with two fish, but I was still, I think, in 14th place. And I was happy because the sun was shining and I had full third period, plan was kind of working, full third period where I could go hit those currented docks. And what I ended up stumbling upon was that those docks no longer had current on them the current seams had really pushed out deeper from the dock. So very few of the docks had the type of current I was looking for. And I caught a couple of shorts, but that bite was almost completely dead. Uh, so with about a half hour, I ran way back up the river, burned a bunch of my fishing time and ended up catching in the last 15 minutes, two more scoreable bass, a couple of shorts, a couple of sheephead, a catfish. And I was like, the bite's really good. So uh, I ended the day in 20th place, <clears throat> right on the cut line. Day two, I decided I would go back up the river, but I wanted to start on that one dock with the current seam because that was down lake, and then I was about 15 miles past that to get back up the river. So I ended up burning a lot of time on day two driving because I did start right on that dock, caught three or four shorts, never got another keeper bite off of it. Then went up the river and just started bumping around up the river, and again, you know, I, I really kind of struggled. The first period, I think I had one fish. Second period, I had one fish. And the third period, I ended up catching three keepers all up the river. Uh, the current seams all were repositioning. Everything was repositioned. So a lot of those fish were coming off of new spots. The reality is I still caught five good scoreable fish. I had five for 14 something. Uh, and I lost those three fish. So, you know, I missed it. I think I missed the, the cut by four pounds. And over those two days, I lost so many fish. It was just ridiculous. I mean, that one four and a half pounder probably gets me in. And then I also I also had, I think, four or five fish that scored one pound, 15 ounces. So I, I feel very, very confident that what I was doing was a decent pattern. I'm not gonna sit here and say it was a winning pattern, but I do think had I executed cleanly, it was a 35 pound a day pattern, which, if you did that on day three and you did on day four, you'd end up making day four and you would have ended up, you know, right in the middle of the pack of fifth place, which would have been a great finish. So that's the recap. Now, from a bait standpoint, man, it was pretty straightforward and simple. I pretty much caught everything on two baits in the tournament. You know, I these were my baits that were working well. 
During practice, the one day I was down fishing the spotted bass, I was catching a pile of fish on the core tackle hover rig, uh, a light one, a 360 ports one out with a shad impact, Kitek shad impact and pearl white. Getting a lot of bites on that, but the quality just wasn't what I was looking for versus up in the river when I did get bit, it was generally a keeper. I got a lot less bites, but it was generally a keeper. And I liked that. And I knew where my bites were gonna come. And I also felt like that was gonna be my best opportunity of potentially finding a school. If you find the right current seam, you're gonna have, you could have 10 keeper fish on 10 casts. I just never found that, but I know that was up there. I just never found it. So <clears throat> in the tournament, my one, two punch was pretty straightforward. Now I did throw, I did have three different jigs rigged up. This is the one that I grabbed out. Just they were all little finesse tungsten jigs. So this one right here is the uh, Kitek casting jig, a half ounce. I threw the Picasso Little Petey in a 3 8 ounce. And then I also had uh, just a, it's the Aaron Martin's tungsten football jig uh, that I had in the half ounce as well. And for me, the, the decision to throw, any of those jigs really came down to the depth that I was fishing. So if, if the current seam was deeper, say 12 feet, I was throwing that Picasso football jig, the tungsten football jig. If I was fishing, uh, there were a few areas where I had just like three, four to five foot of water and I could let the current just kind of wash that bait down. I was throwing the little spotty by Picasso because it just kind of rolls over the bottom well. And then if I was fishing more around an isolated target, so say a tree or I was skipping under a dock, I generally went with the, the Kitek casting jig uh, just because I feel like it's a little bit more weedless. But in, in general, I would say the bites were almost completely even across the board. The color on them all was green pumpkin. I had the little uh, three inch pit boss by Berkeley on the back in green pumpkin color. I did experiment with putting chartreuse on it. Uh, don't know that that made a huge difference. But that was the bait that I caught probably, those baits I'll say, I probably caught about 60% of the fish on. Uh, but then there were also some fish sitting up higher in the current seams. And that's uh, what I was catching them on right here was the uh, core tackle swim jig. You can see how beaten up this thing is. All, every one of my big fish came on this guy. Everything, you know, I had several three and a halfs, uh, several fish that were right around three pounds and they all came on the swim jig. So chartreuse in white, this is the Goldilocks color. These will be available here. If you're going to the Bassmaster Classic, they'll be there. Whatever's left over, we'll put on the website and I'll give you guys a heads up as to when that's coming. Uh, but then from a trailer standpoint, I had both the Reaction Innovations in, what is this, White Trash? This is the um, uh, Skinny Dipper. And then I also had the white pearl color of the Berkeley Grass Pig. Both of those were in the four and a half inch size. I cut, the, I cut the head off, maybe you can see that, uh, but I cut about an inch off both those. And I like the bigger, the bigger stiffer baits because they lock on these uh, swim jigs really well based on the design of them. And then they also have bigger boot tails so you get much better rolling action. But this little guy was definitely dynamite for the fish that were sitting up a little bit higher in the current seams or where I was fishing, uh, you know, some of the shallower current seams, you know, if I was fishing, uh, I'll say five or six foot of water, I, after fishing, say the jig, I would throw this, or I would throw this if it was in my hand. And then I'd pick the jig up afterwards. And it definitely seemed like there were some fish that were higher up. They wanted this. And then there were other fish that were definitely sitting on the bottom, probably behind a rock that wanted the jig. In either case, it was a really good one, two punch, uh, never lost the fish on the swim jig. I, I would have, I probably in hindsight should have thrown it more on the first day than I did. Uh, Cause on the second day, I think four, maybe three of my five fish came on it. But <clears throat> overall, again, I mean, that, that was the, the setup, you know, from a rod and reel standpoint, uh, you know, these are my custom rods that I build MHX uh, NMB 874 blank. So it's a seven, three medium, heavy, fast action rod. I had an Abu Garcia Xenon X. Now these were faster speed reels. This is the 8.1, I believe is what it is. If I can find it wherever you are. Um, it's the 8.1 or 8.0, whatever it is. Uh, I always forget, everything is always different. Uh, anyways, 
So with 15 pound straight fluorocarbon, <clears throat> the faster reel was important because that current would just rip that bait down and you had to keep up with it. And then the finesse jigs, all of them I threw on the same rod blank, but one power lighter. So it's the NMB 873, 73 medium heavy fast action rod. Uh, I just like the little bit lighter medium heavy for fishing the lighter jigs. You know, they're smaller, more compact jigs. That one's a little bit stiffer. I like to throw a little bit heavier bait on that. Uh, and then from a rod and reel standpoint, this is the Abu Garcia Xenon MGX. Again, this is an 8.1, if I can find it on here, 8.3 to one. So very fast reel, uh, 15 pound fluorocarbon, Berkeley 100% fluorocarbon again. And that was my setup, guys. That did the damage. Like I said, I did have, uh, you know, I had a hover rig uh, rigged up. I caught a couple of fish on that uh, around some isolated current breaks that I just kind of let it flow down. I did not catch any keepers. I also caught a couple of fish on a uh, War Eagle spinnerbait. No keepers on that either. But that's it. I'm, uh, man, I'm pretty disappointed because I really feel like I should have, I should have had a much better day. The other thing is like, that's my favorite way to fish. So like I had a blast doing it because I don't often get to fish a professional level tournament like that, uh, meaning heavy current, fishing current seams. And generally I do pretty well in those situations. And in this case, I just did not execute, unfortunately. But we're home. Uh, you know, we uh, are heading off to the Bassmaster Classic here tomorrow. So if you're watching this, this will probably be airing while I'm at the Bassmaster Classic. So make sure you swing by for that. Anyways, guys. Let me know if you have any additional questions, put it in the comments section. Otherwise, I appreciate all the support from all of you. So thanks for watching.